Welcome back to season eight of Talking with Traders. This is the fourth year of this podcast since it began in 2020. Once again, IG Markets have come on board as the sponsor of this podcast. We're truly grateful and privileged to have such a global leader in CFD trading as our sponsors. In the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing various guests from around the globe on the topic of trading. Some of these will be past guests that we invite back onto the podcast, and some will be new guests. The idea is to attract a broad spectrum of different perspectives from players in different areas of the markets. None of what you hear here is financial advice, but it is intended to get you thinking about how you might be able to apply what you hear here to your own trading and investing. Remember to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. That way, you'll be notified when new episodes are released. Once again, thank you to IG Markets for sponsoring this podcast into its fourth year. And thank you listeners for your continued support of this podcast. Now let's get into this week's episode. Welcome to this week's edition of Talking with Traders. And this week, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jeff Hirsch to the podcast. Uh, Jeff is the the editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac, uh, also known as as the Almanac Trader. And uh, this is something that's been going for, what, five decades? It was started by your dad, Jeff. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Talking with Traders. It's really great to have you. I've been very much looking forward to this. And uh, and welcome and tell us a little bit about your background and the, the stock traders sure. almanac how it started how are you keeping it going? Uh, well, it's easy to keep going. My father laid the groundwork pretty well. Um, I mean, it's as old as me. It's fifty seven years old. I'm fifty seven, so it's either it's easy to remember my age. I mean, I grew up with it. Um, was looking at charts as a wee lad. Um, just cycles, seasonalities, patterns, you know, market analysis, stock picks. It's all something I was born, bred, weaned, raised on, market history. I mean, we used to watch Wall Street Week at dinner on Friday nights, you know, uh, in the house. So it's just embedded in in me. So, I mean, I took over from dad, um, you know, around the turn of the century, but uh, I've been working with him for 20 some odd years. I started full time with him in about late 89, early 1990. But I mean, he created this thing. Uh, You know, there was a point when I didn't want to work with him or not didn't want to. But, you know, as a young guy, you always want to try to do your own thing. Yeah. And I had a great friend who's like, Jeff, what are you doing? Go work for your father. And luckily it clicked. I mean, I didn't um, have the same exact mind as him, but there were some things that he was explaining to people uh, that were working with him at the time that there's one instance in particular that. You know, everyone else was kind of like, yeah, I didn't really know what he was talking about. I was like, you know, I feel I got you, Dad. I understand what you're saying now. I'm, and that was kind of like the hook that pulled me in. But, um, you know, he had come out of the music industry. Uh, he was a songwriter and he has he has a degree from or had a degree. He's, he's no longer with us. Um, left us just over two years ago at 98 years old. But wow. um, he went to Brooklyn College, got a degree in music on the GI Bill from uh, you know World War II. And um, we have a somewhat famous cousin, sort of famous, uh, Sam Koslow, who wrote songs like Cocktails for Two and My Old Flame and was out in Hollywood. And um, dad hitchhiked out to California, um, you know, when he was young and started and got the bug. And then he, he came back from, you know, after World War II and was working in the music industry. And Sam, this, I mean, this is how the whole thing started, you know, who I called my godfather, you know, Jews don't normally have godfathers, but Uncle Sam was, you know, he was that guy that, uh, yeah. you know, you had. And he was a student of the market. He had sold his um, publishing company to like RCA for stock. And it was like back, you know, in like the late 20s or whatever, 30 or something. And it was like the crash. So he lost a lot of money there, became a student of the market um and had at one point he wrote a book called super yields uh but back in 1960 61 he had this idea to create a publication with stock market indicators um called indicator digest 
ended up being a big proving grounds for analysts and, and moves that are writers and that sort of thing. He ran, he runs an ad in Barron's back in the old days. They did this thing called an AB split two ads. There's two presses, two different headlines. You test the price, you know, it was great for, for marketing and, and testing things. And the ad hit. So he calls Yale, my father and says, Yale, I need you to run operations. And it was out of uh, Palisades Park, New Jersey, which used to be famous for an amusement park. And, um, it, you know, it was a big hit. And then a few years later, <clears throat> in about, you know, it was 1966 or 65, when I was still in utero, uh, you know, like <laughs> my mom was, was pregnant with me when my father incorporated, went out on his own. He has this idea to take all of these indicators, patterns and trends and put them in one calendar format book so he could follow the markets patterns along with his own. And lo and behold, that's the stock traders almanac. He spent about 18 months or so, about a part of two years, putting the book together and ended up releasing the first edition in 19, in 67, it was the 1968 edition. And, um, you know, it, it ended up clicking with a lot of people it still does. I mean, you, you were here together. It still clicks with you. Yep. Um, and you're, and you're not even, you know, in the, you know, you're over across the sea there, across yep. the pond, as you say. Yeah. And um, it became a, a, a real tool for, for stockbrokers back, back then, you know, advisors now, where it was a connection for, with them and their clients. Um, and, you know, we, I, mean, I grew up shipping these books all over the world. I remember, you know, putting London addresses, uh, you know, on handfuls or quantities of almanacs to ship over to the brokers over there that would give them out to their clients for the holidays. Hong Kong, Zurich, you know, Chicago, California, all over the country and world, people buying these books. So, yeah. Um, but I, I'll tell you that. Go yeah, to to that to to your point, right? Um, I mean, I've I've been in the market now about twenty four years, and I'm I'm from South Africa originally. You might mm -hmm. tell from the accent. I'm now based in London, but um, early on in my career, we on our desk we would order the Stock Traders Almanac. So you weren't just sending it to to London and Frankfurt and and you know to the developed world and one of those copies made it made its way to johannesburg and we we had that in fact we ordered them each year uh for our desk and what was, and, what was the firm's name oh it was a firm called boe stockbrokers so I, you may I, remember I probably it. shipped them out there you probably did yeah and i just remember looking at that it was just such an interesting book that came out every year with different interesting little anecdotes about different days of the year um you know, why certain days are stronger than others and how this particular day historically has performed or how the market has done leading into President's Day holiday and afterwards or, you know, all of these sort of things. And I mean, we're going to talk about some of these patterns mm -hmm. now during the podcast, but uh, sure. it, it goes back a long way. And and as I say, I've been familiar with the Stock Traders Almanac since then. Uh, and and obviously, well, now here we are talking 20 years odd later after I, mm -hmm. after I first used it. So it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you. But that, so so the the almanac is essentially it's it's identifying repeatable patterns or some somewhat repeatable right seasonality mm -hmm. in the markets. Um, something that that you mentioned on your website, which I, which really caught my eye, is the tactical seasonal switching strategy, which uh, which that I want to talk to yeah. you about. Yeah, so basically a seasonal seasonal thing in the market where it says effectively your strongest months are between November and April. And that's when you want to be invested in equities. The rest of the time you want to be invested in fixed interest securities or fixed income securities. I want to talk to you a bit about this because there, there's quite a, a clear <clears throat> uh, winter summer divide in those uh, in those seasonal times in the market. So let's, let's just talk about that. I mean, tell me about this tactical seasonal switching strategy. I mean, it's also known as the best six months of the year. Yeah, uh, it was a strategy Yale discovered in and and made uh, popular and, and published in the 1986 Stock Traders Almanac. And everyone, you know, on the planet calls it sell in May and go away, uh, which is an old British saw. If you don't know, you may. I know you're you're, um, you know, a springbok and not uh, <laughs> a lion at heart. Uh, coming from a former rugby player right over here. So uh, right. Front row guy. So, um, right. uh, but I digress. So, the sell in May and go away, the other side of that phrase is come on back on St. Ledger's Day. Yeah. And you know what St. Ledger's Day is now. It's the, the, the St. Ledger's Stakes. It's the 
last leg of the British Triple Crown happens in, I think, mid-late September, mm. <clears throat> which is sort of the beginning of the London season, the end of the London season, the end of the, you know, country uh, season where people sort of get out of the city, which, you know, is very similar to the, the, the period of time in, in the U.S. where you have this sort of Memorial Day to Labor Day period where people are doing other things. Most of the planet is in the northern hemisphere, most of the landmass, most of the population. Yeah. We have this period of time in late spring and summer and early fall where we have a lot more daylight. We do a lot more things outside and a lot less business goes on. And this is the sort of pattern that um, we've seen in the last 70 years or so. In the earlier part of the, the 20th century and prior, most of the economies were driven by um, farming and agriculture. So you had sort of a different seasonal imp impact where you saw, you know, more of a buy in May situation where uh, farmers would be buying fuel and food and, and, you know, seed and fertilizer and hiring and borrowing money. And then in September, October at harvest, they'd have to pay back their loans and, and, and business, you know, the cash coming into the economy would slow down. So we see this pattern where the market makes most of its gains from November through April um, and goes pretty much sideways May through October. Uh, I have a sort of a, um, you know, tongue in cheek uh, or cheeky uh, um, retort for sell a man, go away. I say you got to buy in October to get your portfolio sober. Right. Yeah. I like it's that. Been on point the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, it's not that the market is going to sell off and crash and go and, and drop, uh, you know, between May and October, but it tends to suffer uh, and go sideways. And we've seen, um, uh, you know, the gains are about seven and a half percent for the Dow during the best months, like 0.8 for the worst months. Use some compounding and some technical analysis. I have a whole slide deck presentation on that that I, you know, that that I do uh, different pieces and parts of. But yeah. Um, yeah. it works. Uh, we use a little MACD timing to get in there, um, at, you know, in and out at, at more opportune times, and it, it practically triples the the results. Um, with the power of compounding. Uh, and there's there's also an interesting thing, you know, a lot of the market patterns are, are driven by, I mean, all of them are driven by human behaviors, repetitive human behaviors, behavioral finance. Mm -hmm. And the most, you know, in, influential or, 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 you know, impactful humans in the stock market are the institutions. And they do a lot around the quarter, quarterly performances and statements and year end. And there's this, um, Part of the uh, IRS code uh, for 40 act, you know, funds, mutual funds and ETFs where they have to reconcile their accounting by October 31st every year. Right. Where they take the existing year's 10 months, the previous year's 12 months reconciled with the last year's, you know, 10 months at the time. And they have to make these, you know, filings and transactions. And then they're also, um, you know, trying to put window dress their portfolios for year end. And the end of the quarter, that's why we see that sort of uh, uh, volatility and, and sort of negatively influenced volatility at the, in September, into October. Um, and that helps create this, this, you know, tactical switching strategy, this best six months. And um, I use it. It works. Uh, it's been working year in and year out. Um, I'll give you one more sort of proof uh, of, of the strategy. I know you're you familiar with the book Evidence Based Technical Analysis. Yeah, yeah. David Aronson. Um, I, I privileged to be part of a, a listserv where where he's in there and, and injects some some knowledge and things. But when he put that book out, they tested about six thousand. I think it was like sixty two hundred different black box systems. Right. Uh, and they put them all through the scientific method. You know, to, trying to disprove the null hypothesis that the results were. You know. Um, the result of chance and and had no predictive power they all failed when we picked that book you know what's coming here yeah when we when we picked that book as our best investment book of the year back in 08 i think we don't do best investment books of the year because of amazon doesn't really matter anymore but um we asked him to put the best six months you know the, the switching strategy through the same paces right and he did it with his with his partner there. I think Timothy Masters, Dr. Timothy Masters is the guy there. But uh, and they started in 87, the year after it was first published in the Almanac. And they found, unlike any of the other 6,200 different systems that 
this strategy had predictive power and the results were not the result of chance. Yeah. So we got that guy. <laughs> and it's so simple. <laughs> it's so simple. It's simple. Yeah. I mean, there's a little, a little wrinkle with it, with using the MACD, but, um, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're not going to pick the exact top, the exact bottom. No. No. You get in there close. I mean, yeah. we had our signal in early October when the market popped. Then we bottomed on October 27th. We didn't get the bottom. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, you know, it's still up, what, 15 something oh, percent on average it's now? It's absolutely roaring ahead. I mean, it, I see, we, you know, it's a little bit of a reversal happening today, but that's one day. I mean, there's been an incredible rally since the end of October in the in the U.S. markets. But 15 out of the last, 14 out of the last 15 weeks positive. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 unprecedented. I think that's only ever happened seven times in history. So it's been it's been a very strong time for the for the market now, but mm -hmm. it's interesting what you said about uh, how it triples the performance. So I mean, I know on your website, I think that the numbers are probably slightly out of date, but it said there that um, since two thousand and one, this tactical switching strategy has given you six hundred percent, which I'm sure it's more by now. And I think the S you're looking at the stock portfolio there. Is that what I'm looking at? Okay. It it, it mentions, it says S&P 500 is up 266% over that's that That's the period. stock picks. Okay. That's, that's stock picks. That's is a that little not, bit. That, uh, that's, that's not just the best six months. We do have a seasonal overlay, overlay on that, but we're right. picking stocks, doing a fundamental right. screen, technical analysis, and using the time of the year. So that's that's not just the switching in and out of the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ. Uh, stuff, but, okay. So there's a little bit of fundamental analysis that goes in there which was i mean one of the first things dad taught me when i started working for him was price to sales ratio when we were looking at stocks yes so there's yeah. some of that you know undervalued you know good growth great growth actually and and sort of underfollowed under the radar type of stock picking going on yeah there. yeah yeah okay but the numbers for the best and worst six months i'll give them to you with the, with the macd it's um that has had 7.5% for the Dow during the best months. Right. 0.8 for the worst months. Yeah. Um, and you take a, a hypothetical compound, a ten thousand dollars in the beginning in the first year, nineteen fifty, compounding gives you about a million point two um in in gains. Wow. In the best months versus thirty three hundred dollars in the worst months. That's just incredible. Ed MACD. The, the percent change goes up to 8.8 .8 versus minus 0.5 for the worst, but it goes to $3.4 million gain versus minus uh, a loss of $5,500, dollars So that's, that's incredible. almost triples it, but with the compounding power and a little bit of timing, also, yeah. you know, you end up staying a little bit longer sometimes or getting right. out a little bit earlier. That's not just getting in. And that's, yeah. that's one of the things that we try to do in the service, in the newsletter service as well is you not not try to this is what we do we don't just tell you what to buy we tell you when to buy it when to sell it where to put your buy limit where to put your stop loss you know and we'll we'll get out of things like in <clears throat> in 22 the midterm election year i don't know if you remember we we came in pretty cautious pretty worried yeah. about a bear market yes then russia invades ukraine the market starts crumbling. And by the time we got our sell signal, our tactical switching strategy, our best six month sell signal in early April ish, we were already stopped out of all of the stock and ETF positions in the portfolios because just sticking to the system, you know, and, yeah. you know, we, the losses were, were limited. We got some of these, these things were stopped out after the head gains where we, we move a trailing stop up. So, it was pretty a pretty good testament to the to the methodology and, and the systems that we employ. So it's not it's simple, but you know, there's a little more layer on there than just one one binary buy year. But for some subscribers, they just you know they they buy the best six months and sell the best six months. Yeah. Some of them do the Nasdaq best eight, and it's like two trades a year and um, pretty good. Amazing and and very simple and I mean those are those are spectacular returns over the long term absolutely spectacular and such so, such a simple system. There's a number of other uh, interesting patterns that you that you talk about in a lot of the stuff that I read of yours on blogs of yours and think work that I see of yours elsewhere which we'll talk about in a, in a while. But a couple of them I want to just touch on. Um, the one that has been quite topical recently, obviously, and it is every year, is the Santa Claus rally, and. Um, 
I, and I know some people think that the Santa Claus rally, you know, must must start in like October when they start putting Christmas decorations oh, in the shops. In, but it's in not. August for yeah, some. yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but I mean, I know your your Santa Claus rally. I think is the last five days of the year and the first two days of the new year. I think is if I'm not wrong. Mm -hmm. But I always like the saying, um, which I think your dad obviously coined: "If Santa Claus should fail to call, bears may come to broad and wall." So correct, and and the New York Stock Exchange is on the corner of Broad Street and Wall Street, right? Uh, yes, but but let's talk about that a little bit. I mean, I know this last year, um, now end of twenty twenty three, coming into twenty four, mm -hmm. the Santa Claus rally, you know, Santa Claus didn't actually call. Nope. He was the market was down over that period. Um, but then that also leads us to a couple of other things: the Janu January barom barometer and the January trifecta. Let's talk mm -hmm. about some of those seasonal patterns quickly. Tell me about the, the the Santa Claus rally first of all, what we should be looking for there specifically, and, and well, what the seasonal tendency is there. The tendency. I mean, this is something Yale discovered back in 1972. It's in the 73 almanac, along with the full month January barometer. Um, which is as January goes, so goes the year for the S&P. Then there's this old first five days indicator, which comes from way back the 30s or 40s. It's been in the almanac since the beginning. Um, but Santa Claus, you know, rally, which it's it's used because it's a great night. It's a great, you know, phrase. Mm -hmm. And dad's line, you know, as you quoted perfectly, just re resonates. But you have this week of the year where a lot of us are doing other things other than the market. I know London gets pretty holiday oriented as do a lot of as does New York and people travel and take time off and go socialize with family and friends. But the traders are working and they're trying to pick up bargain stocks um, during that week. And it's usually a pretty, you know, clear buying week for, for the desks. Um, you know, the gains for the S&P not impressive, about one and a half percent over time. But when it's not happening, when the market's not going up, it's showing that traders are nervous. So it, it's it's a warning sign. It's not, yeah. you know, binary. If it's down, sell everything. It's just, hey, start looking at the other, you know, analysis, the other indicators, the other, you know, metrics that you use or that one uses to, to track the market. And, um, you know, over the years, January, which has been, you know, a very bullish month, has, um, you know, become prone to some profit taking as we saw this year, especially early on. Mm. So we saw the January barometer register a bunch of errors in recent years. So it was about 10, 11 years ago, uh, my partner, Christopher Mistel and I decided to stand on Yale's shoulders um, so we could see further as Isaac Newton. <laughs> and we took the Santa Claus rally that Yale created, the January barometer that Yale created in the first five days, and we made this trifecta. Now everyone's using the word trifecta too. When all three are up, the numbers are phenomenal. The market's up almost 91% of the time those years. Average gains like 17.7% for the year, just like we had in 23. The next 11 months are great. And when um, either one of those are down, it tends to be the, the returns are, are, are diminished. However, in years like this year, when you have down first five days, down Santa Claus rally, but an up January, it's pretty bullish. It's only a handful, or it's actually only three previous years since 1950, but all the years are up. Uh, let's see. I have the stat over here just to make sure I get it right. Um, what was it? It's like 19.9% uh, average full year gain 15.1 the last 11 months well wow. you know up three out of three granted it's only three but um there's also several other bullish factors here so yeah we didn't find any um anything to detract from our already you know bullish forecast we've put out uh with the santa claus being down i know everyone likes to talk about it because it's fun but um, and it gets attention for, yeah. for the almanac and us, so I'm okay with it. But yeah. it's not necessarily sell everything if Santa Claus is down. It's yeah. just a little warning. Start right. Looking. Yeah. Do some homework, you know? Just be cautious. Yeah. Okay. All right. No, fair enough. And let's talk about the, the four year presidential cycle yeah. now as well. Um, obviously, we're in an election year this year. But there's quite yeah. a clear seasonal pattern that the markets tend to follow over that four-year presidential cycle from the work that I've seen of yours. Mm -hmm. um, and and 
look, I mean, I know the fourth, well, the, the election year, which is what we're in now, typically is a positive year, uh, with most most of the gains being sort of back end loaded from what I could see. But let's talk about fourth just the- Fourth quarter is good in every year. You know? Yeah, fourth quarter is always good, right. Okay. But I guess that also then talks to your, your best six months of the year, right? So, so it kind of does. Yeah. But the, the thing that's a little bit more interesting here with the, the, um, the four year cycle is, you know, this particular cycle, and I'm just looking at my chart of it. I mean, you've got a pattern to each year, you know, you know, like also in the book, we can talk about it. So we may, may not get into it. Mm. Dif different months. There's a general monthly pattern for all months on average, but different months have different personalities. Different years of the four-year cycle had different personalities. 22 was a textbook classic midterm election year bottom. Yeah. Um, you know, and last year, 23 was a perfect picture, perfect pre-election year with the gains coming at year end and, and the chart pattern. So this particular four-year cycle, um, 21, 2, and 3, and so far into 24, have been tracking the four-year cycle pattern, not just the seasonal patterns, but the four-year pattern just on, on, on so close it's it's uncanny it's a little bit yeah. um i get a little nervous you know it's, <laughs> it's gonna stop being this perfect at some point yeah yeah there have been times in the past where i've seen it not be like the, the end of the 90s where every year was up we didn't really have a you know a, a, a down midterm year so there are other factors other than seasonality other than like four-year cycle stuff and other things that, that drive these patterns that can over you know power them Right. Okay. But in the short term, I mean, let's just think about right now where we are. So we're yeah. we're recording this on the 12th of February. Um, and this podcast is going to go out in uh in three days' time, by the way. But um right. from what I've seen of your work in the terms of the seasonal pattern, it looks like round about now ish market makes a slight peak in February. I mean, I'm not I'm not gonna obviously hold you to this, of course not. But it it looks <laughs> I'm not worried. It, it looks like yeah, you know, there's a small peak in, in February and then sort of a little bit of weakness into March. Uh and then it seems to sort of pick up a bit from there. Then that that's seasonal patterns going back to 1950, from what I've seen of of your work. And then some of the other stuff I saw from D Ryan Detrick from um Carson Group, and I don't know if he's referencing your work or if he's done his own work there. But, uh, he, but he's I'm an not... he's he's an almanac user in fit. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. He he he's, he he thinks we're along similar lines, and we run similar studies. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just interesting. I mean, is that and that, that's what we're looking at potentially now? Uh, markets run very very hard into this into the I, first week yeah. of February, second week of February now. Do we the do seasonal we... charts do suggest some potential weakness from mid February to mid to mid March? Right. Um, we know historically that February's weakness is is loaded towards the end of the month. Mm -hmm. You can see it in the almanac where the angry bulls sort of cluster towards the latter part of the month. And on the, the typical seasonal chart that we put out recently for the recent period of time, it's you know pretty much a mid month peak. Right. Um but, uh, you know, other than, you know, like some of the, the, the technical levels that I'm looking at, I mean, 4,800 on the on S&P looks like a, an easy, you know, support level it used to be the, the highs, um, yeah. Yeah. which is what, seven or eight per six, seven percent from from 5,000 or something like that. Yeah, not even. It's it's about, well, it's about 4%. About 4 yeah. yeah, about 4%. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if we go a bit higher, um, I think we could probably pull back to there, but yeah. you know, this 5,000 can be, uh, uh, you know, an ominous number. It's the big round numbers. The market tends to impact the market psychologically. Yeah. We haven't fallen off of it yet. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to fall too far, but, um, we're, we've got buy limits in below the market for all of our stocks. So we're, we're going to be looking at it as a buying opportunity, um, Probably get some further softness in Q2, Q3, right, right along with the, the seasonal pattern that we've been talking about. Right. And, um, you know, with, with the election year, though, one of the things that I learned from from Pop was that, you know, you can sort of reverse handicap or sort of look at it both ways. Like the market will forecast the, the election. You know, the market's like don't like uncertainty. So if something's going to happen with the incumbent, especially a sitting president running, which is another thing we can talk about. Markets like they're going to be a little weaker. And if the market's a little weaker, that probably means 
the incumbent is, is less likely to win. If the incumbent's less likely to win, the market's going to be lower. So, you, but in the end, fourth quarter, still good. After the election, you know, when they oust uh, an unpopular president, the market rallies. And, you know, sort of a ding dong, the witch is dead effect that I like to <laughs> joke with a little bit. But also, we get closure. We get a decision one way or another. And the market likes having a decision. So it yeah. sort of rallies after the election, regardless of the, of the results, mm. except in years like 2000, when we had an undecided election, you know, and the mm. uh, market didn't like that. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, and I just want quickly before we wrap up, we have a little bit of time left, but um, any particular seasonal patterns in the first week of the month that you typically follow? Uh, with with money coming into mutual funds and portfolios and things, is there any s- sort of strength to the first week of the month that is that is particularly prevalent over these long periods of time that you that you've analyzed? It, it's gotten a little bit less prevalent, but the okay. the original and there's a, a several pages on it in the almanac about the cash flows, which you're you're highlighting on very accurately. Yeah. The thing that Yale discovered back you know before I came on full time was the monthly five-day bulge was the last day of the month plus the first four days of the new month where people do all of their transacting um, and things happen. And then um, in the early days, after a few years when I was working for them, we were noticing, and I, this was one of the calculations I used to do by hand with a, a using Barron's underlining days up or uh, and, and calculating them on an adding machine and doing graph paper before we put it into Excel, which is one of the things that I did when we started. And we're looking at this, you know, doing these calculations. And when you do things by hand, like uh, my friend Helene Miser does the chartist, when she does her charts by hand, you really, you learn, you see things yeah. instead of hitting a button and letting, a, a, you know, a macro or an algorithm do something for you. When you actually do it, even you, even if you're using the computer, you, you, you notice a lot of things. It yeah. allows you to observe. And we saw this mid-month um, spike in, in d- more days that are up. And what we realized was, as you mentioned, the cash flow coming into the first week of the month, there's also this injection of capital that comes into the institutions from the bi-monthly or every two weeks payroll deductions going into uh, in the, all the 401ks and IRAs where people's money are coming in. And these you know, managers, these institutions have to put that money to work. It's got to go along the market. They're not shorting. They're not, they don't have the liberty to short stuff with that. Or yeah. It's got to go into the stock market. So that's when we see this sort of super eight days where you've got the last two or three plus the first two or three depending on the month and then these middle three you know ninth tenth and eleventh days um but as we update this every year we notice that it's becoming a little bit less prominent that there are so many you know a small number of days that outperforms the other days of the month um but you look at a, a month like august the first nine days of august notoriously weak why? Everyone's away. Right. Still summer, summer holidays in the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. yeah. The holiday. Yeah. So um, unfortunately that we, you know, there's also great times of the, like the turn of October, the last, the, the end of October, end of November, beginning of November, excuse me. Great turn of the month trade. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been a, an incredible market bottom point in, or certainly was last year in 23. Um, 22. And in 22 as well. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. The bear killer. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. For that year-end rally. All right, Jeff. I mean, I, I think I've asked you most of the questions that I wanted to ask you, and we're, we're almost, you know, out of our allotted time anyway. I mm-hmm. just wanted, you know, for for the benefit of the listeners um, who, who have maybe not uh, come across the Stock Traders Almanac, I think they should get themselves a copy of it. As you say, it comes out every year, right? It's re- released and revised and updated every single year. When is Correct. when yep. when does it become usually, available in, in the usually, new year? Usually uh, early, mid-October, we get it out. Right. So we're already about ready to start putting together the 2025 Almanac as we speak. Right. So that we can get it all. I mean, like my outlook in the current book, when I, when I write what I expect to happen in the next year, is dated like June 21st. Right. That's about when we sign off on the final thing and it goes okay. to press. Okay. Okay. So we can have it ready for the October. But, you know, all year long, we're updating it and, and addressing things uh, in the newsletter at stocktradersalmanac.com. We put out 
a few things to the public, you know, daily, weekly, um, at Almanac Trader, uh, you know, if you, you use Twitter or whatever, or just you go to click on the blog with the website. Yep. The book comes free for all members, subscribers. And um, if you click on something that, you know, says you're not a subscriber, there's a seven day trial. You can try things and, and kick the tires and see what you think. Yeah. Okay. All right. So just to say it again, because the, the line did break this, like it's, is it stocktradersalmanac.com? Correct. Okay. Stocktradersalmanac.com. And you can just Google it. It comes up pretty good and pretty well. Yep. yep. So, uh, yeah. And, okay. um, we take, okay. We, we take calls from London from time to time too. So yeah, you know, I'm sure. I'm sure you do. All right. Okay. So they they can get hold of you there. Um, you also, I know your your lot of your blog articles, your free stuff comes out on Tumblr. You've got a Tumblr channel, right? You've got a Tumblr page. I think we're going to move that uh, soon to our own URL. But okay. um, LinkedIn, if that's one of the places that you you know, yeah, you LinkedIn, like to use Twitter, Twitter. What's your Twitter? What's your Twitter handle? At Almanac Trader. At Almanac Trader, right? Okay, fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, it's it's a it's a unique product, and as I say, it's I, I, I've, I've enjoyed using it during my career. Uh, and in fact, I mean, knowing that it comes out in October, it's a really great Christmas stocking gift if you've got a mm -hmm. a, a, a partner or you know, you've got clients who you know want to put something under the Christmas tree. What a lovely gift! I'd certainly be pleased to receive that under my tree. So. <laughs> it's 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 been given away like that for for five six decades it's amazing I yeah love it. yeah good timing good timing all right jeff well I, the line is starting to break up so maybe it's a sign that we got to wrap it up now anyway but it's been a, a, an absolute <laughs> pleasure and uh and an honor to speak to you um thanks so much for making the time well. and and uh and all the best and i hope we can chat again at some stage I do as well. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking with Traders, brought to you by IG, a world leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.